This podcast is brought to you by The Empowerment Project. Research proves that empowerment self-defense training makes you safer, period. I want you to have a great self-defense toolkit so you can create strong boundaries, speak with confidence, and take up all the space that you deserve in the world. We'll hear stories from survivors and find out what worked for them and why. We'll interview leaders in the field and talk about tips, concepts, and really easy things that you could do to make yourself safer and interrupt the cycle of violence. I've taught self-defense classes for over 30 years, and I promise to teach you everything I know. Ultimately, I'm going to want you to get some in-person training, but a great empowerment self-defense class is more than just the physical skills. The list of things I want to teach you is endless, so let's get to it. My name is Sylvia Smart, and welcome to The Empowerment Project. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Empowerment Podcast by Naga. In the last two episodes, we listened to two amazing, strong, and brave women as they recounted their stories of surviving domestic violence and escaping to safety. Today, I am honored to have both of them here with me. Pam and Abigail have come together to share additional pieces of their journey. We'll learn what strategies they use to stay safe. We'll learn how they continue to support one another, their legal challenges, and a lot more. Thank you, Pam and Abigail, for being here with me and for sharing your stories with my listeners. Welcome. Aw, thanks. It's good to be here. Yes, very happy to be here. Thank you both for being here and for sharing your story and for talking with me. I've got a lot of questions and I know my listeners do too. And let's start with how you continue to stay safe. What are things that you need to think about, things that you build build into your daily routine or just Download to us all of this stuff. Like, what do you do? How do you stay safe? This is Abigail. I I can start, Pam, if, if you have additional things, please feel free to add them. Okay. Um, for myself, I always look all the way around me whenever I'm, you know, going to or from someplace where I'm by myself. And I always lock all the doors immediately. I carry bear mace in my purse just in case, because if I am confronted, then I have that available to me so I can make a quick escape. I also don't really show any current information on my um, social media profiles. So that's probably a way for me to stay safe as well. I also don't really disclose too much information to people that I don't know about where I, I actually live, and I use a P.O. box as well. I don't have the bear mace, so I might, <laughs> I might need to get my hands on some of that. Yeah, you can get it at, you know, like a hunting store. Okay, I'm going to advocate for both of you to take a self-defense class too. <laughs> An empowerment self-defense class and like hit things, hit pads feels really good. It's cathartic. You well, know, I, it's... I agree with you. <laughs> agree. <laughs> this is a side note, but <laughs> Sylvia, I took your self-defense class um, for women especially, and no joke, I walked out of the class and was getting in my car, and this dude walks up to me, and he's like, hey, want to go get a drink? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no! <laughs> <laughs> That happened in one of my classes. Um, these two women were, we we had a break and these two women were leaving. And they when they came back, they're like, did you set us up with that guy? <laughs> and I was like, no. And it was the same thing. And they were like, no, don't talk to us. Leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> Where were we? Bear Mace. Okay. <laughs> yes, I... I spoke with a therapist ad nauseum about a lot of these things that we're going to talk about today. And she told me that, yes, it's very healthy to have these thoughts because a lot happened to you. And it's fine to fantasize about, you know, even fantasize about hurting 
Um, and, but the difference between a crazy person and a sane person is that the sane person recognizes that it is a fantasy and that they shouldn't actually act it out. The crazy person does not <laughs> make that distinction. Right. And you are two very sane people. We try. <laughs> <laughs> So what about you, Pam? What are some things that you integrate into your life to keep yourself safe? Um, like Abigail, I'm hyper aware when I'm out shopping or anywhere in public. Um, like, for instance, I avoid certain parts of town where I know he works. And um, I had an incident where I was starting a new gig at a place and I pulled up and realized it was within eye shot of his workplace and I started having a panic attack <laughs> and I'm like trying to get into the building without being spotted like as fast as I could and as I'm like getting in the front door my friend pulls up and there's like only one parallel parking spot left like in the whole area and she's like can you please help me park <laughs> and I was like okay I was freaking out but after like a 20 point turn, we got her into her spot. <laughs> 20 point turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you're both very careful on social media <laughs> and you both use a PO box. And um, what about in, in self-defense classes, we talk about creating uh, like a, a safety net or a, a community of safety. Do you share any of this information with other people so that they can keep a watch out for you as well? Um, I do. I have a small safety net of people that are aware and that they would be ready to help me as needed. The same here. My really close friends and family know what's going on. Um, and even at work, they're aware and um, people will back me up as much as possible. And um, also, similarly, um, people at work know not to post my picture on any of the website things or mention my name publicly, whether it's social media or um, any like newsletters or anything. And my coworkers know if they're taking photos like of company events, like make sure I'm not in it, please. And it's so awkward. I hate, I hate trying to hide in my life. It's very frustrating, but to be safe, I know it's necessary. Like this dude is so scary. He sounds like a monster. Yes. <laughs> he is. And that's, unfortunate but we we survived i was thinking about both of you last night before you know as i was thinking about having this time with you today and i was putting myself in your shoes these are a lot of um a lot of limitations and restrictions to add in to life mm -hmm. and uh, i see why they're so necessary and I was, um, I was imagining that what a relief it would be if he finally could end up in jail. Yeah. That there would be a sense of, of. Absolutely. Yeah. I know I'd feel better. Some other things that are great to think about, like that I think about a lot is um, I've had to cut contact with certain people who are in close contact with him. And sometimes it's family um, or a friend that they've had a really strong bond with, and it's really challenging. Um, and also, like, if I am having contact with a family member, like myself and my child, try to keep any information about where we're at in life or what we're really doing private, which is awkward, but very important. Oh, I was just going to say, I was just going to add that it is important because um, the perpetrator is, you know, still allowed to be out in the world where, you know, he obviously doesn't belong. He should be in jail for the things that he's done. But I'm not 
not in charge of that. So we just have to do the best that we can with what we have. Before we move on to uh, my next question, is there anything more that you want to add? Well, I just wanted to reiterate that it's, it's a very real thing that has happened to both of us and we're not the only ones. And it's important to be able to make the distinction between um, a very real threat and just um, a relationship that's gone sour. There's a very big distinction and it's important for people to understand the gravity of a real threat. Yeah. Our abuser has a tendency to stalk and um, put himself in a vehicle or wherever really close to where we he knows we might be. And it is really scary. Right. He's threatening. Mm-hmm. Yes. He also, you know, would do things to myself where he left an abandoned vehicle that was that I had previously registered. And when our relationship ended, I asked him to change it over to himself. And he did not do that. And he left it abandoned on, you know, the side of the road. And then I got the tow bill for it. And that was, that was a threat that was um, done deliberately to financially and damage my, you know, records for the DMV and, and whatnot. And it was also parked in a place where it was threatening to myself and some other people. Really? Hmm. So this... Kind of a um, plus to say, hey, I know where you are. Yeah, that's what it felt like. It felt really freaking scary. Right. I would say that it felt that way because that's exactly what he was doing. Mm-hmm. He was threatening you. So this is a great segue into my next round of questions. What I'm really curious to hear is how this come about your relationship to one another. I mean, I've heard I've heard from both of you in in as many words that you're that you're continuing to support one another that you have been very supportive to one another. So can you, can you talk to us about how, how that came about and how it is and what it's like? (laughs) Well, that makes me smile that you you said it in that way. Um, I just wanted to start by saying Pam is an amazing person and I don't think I would have been as successful in my exit if it wasn't for her. Yeah. When you reached out, I was so relieved in a way because I, it was so scary for me to try to call you to see how you were doing because I didn't know, like, if you were happy or, you know, what kind of mindset you were in. So maybe the first thing out of my mouth when you called was, I've been waiting for your call. Yeah, you said you were happy that I called and you'd been waiting for me to call you for years, I think you said. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I was. And I had to sit down, if I recall, because I was like, wow, that's just so strange and beautiful at the same time. We talked for a really long time, like maybe two hours the first time you called. I just remember being outside and just um, you were in a place where you weren't sure like, if you thought what was going on was going on. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And so I felt t- like I was going a little crazy. Yeah, yeah. But in retrospect, that was also by design. Yeah. Right. That's exactly by design. Mm-hmm. And he would tell me on many different occasions in all kinds of different ways that I was crazy and that I needed to get help and that there was something wrong with me and that I didn't like being a mother and that. You know, I had all these problems and just terrible, terrible things that tore me down. That I didn't, I didn't quite understand that that's what was going on. Which, in saying it even now, it, it sounds like you know I I must have the IQ of a potato or something. But when you're in that sort of situation, you 
are slowly convinced of things that you wouldn't normally, after being out of a situation, that you wouldn't normally um, believe. If that sounds. Mm -hmm. That's so typical, Abigail, of of people who are in these abusive relationships. It's a strategy that the perpetrator uses to keep themselves in a position of power. And it is done absolutely by design to con to keep the power, to keep that power dynamic. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Well, right. And thank you for saying that. And, and I know that now, but at the time I just, I had to reach out to Pam when I finally found a good phone number for her because it took me a while to find her. <laughs> and so good job on, on hiding yourself online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did have a phone number out on purpose and I, I don't know where you found it, but sometimes I'll try to put by the phone number that I advocate for domestic violence survivors. <laughs> so I just wanted to make it like really clear to whoever might be looking for me for that purpose that here to help. So how are ways that you, um, that you support one another now? Clearly you have a, a nice, tight, trusting relationship. How do, how does it play out? Um, well, maybe the way it started was I knew I wasn't prepared to leave and I gave her all the information I had about my own leaving and um, helped her realize it was really important to just act like everything was normal and then disappear when he was out of town. Yes, I agree. That was key because her story and the violence that ensued when she tried to leave, holding a baby, mm -hmm. mind you, which just made it you know, his actions doubly wicked. Just the, the behavior that went on um, made me realize the danger that I really was in. Mm -hmm. And I knew from my experience that he really didn't seem to care about the children. He just wanted to get at me and he would use the kid kids in any way possible to hurt us. And that's really scary. Yes, absolutely. Recently, I just feel so comforted when we talk to each other because some of the things I personally have been through with this guy are so unbelievable that I find myself having to explain in great detail all of this stuff that's kind of traumatizing to talk about. And um, we can talk about it and not have to explain. And it's so comforting. And I just feel like a really strong bond with with Abigail for that reason. Likewise, we're not crazy. It happened. <laughs> There's something so sweet about not having to go back and explain mm -hmm. because the, you know, and especially for the two of you, it's not just that you're both survivors. It's that you survived the same guy. Mm -hmm. Right. I think we're kind of trained as women to fight with each other. And the um, I always had the impression that the only time it was okay to be mad was if it was at another woman over a guy or something. Being open to friendship, being open to helping each other um, can take a lot of energy for people who aren't used to bonding with women. And I don't know, it's, I find this relationship is just really comforting and really powerful. And then um, do you check in with one another regularly or do you keep one another posted on current situations or how's the ongoing communication? Sometimes it can be a while before we'll, we'll reach out, like life gets busy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it ups and flows, but we're always in touch one way or the other you know like even if it's a silly text or something or like one of the silly looking stickers or something yeah. <laughs> that's awesome a joke well you are 
clearly each of you is a gift to the other. So I that's wonderful. More. I'd love to move on now that we've smiled and feel that the two of you have some support. I'd love to talk with you about the legal challenges that have presented themselves to you and any other challenges um, that each of you has faced or that you face together or come together around and um, only as much as it feels safe to talk about. I think what I have to say up front is that we have gone through a lot of legal things together or like trying to help each other that we probably won't talk about here because they're just too, too much. <laughs> so um, Abigail and I were talking about how getting good legal representation is very expensive and how we might have had better outcomes if we were better funded. And she, she might be able to speak more about that. As far as the legal things, it's, it's difficult to disclose exactly what the, the legal ins and outs are because, well, A, I'm not an attorney. And, <laughs> and, and that's why, you know, it's, it's difficult to say because it depends on what jurisdiction that um, a victim might live in and what options are available to them. I will say that I've, I've run into a lot of chauvinism. Mm -hmm. I've run into a lot of judgment that there was no call for in trying to pursue what I know that I rightfully deserve to be able to file and what I rightfully deserve to file on behalf of my children. Mm -hmm. If I could make a wish and, you know, have a magical wand and, you know, try to give people advice that are going through um, something similar on the other side and trying to figure out what to do, I would say the number one thing is to seek the advice of an attorney. And while there are many good public defenders out there, you have to remember who's writing their checks. And a lot of times public defenders are overwhelmed, they're overbooked, and they just want to, you know, get all their cases done. And at the end of the day, they don't, they don't really have an incentive to do what the right choice would be if you were actually their client and you were paying their, their fees. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a weird thing to say, but that's my experience. Mm -hmm. So I would seek legal counsel immediately and at, at least have a consultation and kind of lay down things that are going on enough so that they, the you know, potential attorney can understand what may or may not to be, need to be filed and that they can then make a decision as to whether they would be able to represent you or who they can refer you to. And if I could make a wish, I would say there, I wish there were, you know, a big bucket of funding available for victims of domestic violence or the legal side, because it's very expensive, but well worth it, especially if children are involved, to be able to gain full custody of them. Mm -hmm. And that's key. That's the one big key factor if they're involved and you need full custody. We were both thankfully able to get full custody, and um, I cannot imagine the trauma our kids would have experienced if he was allowed visitation um, that wasn't supervised. And he, in my case, never used visitation, thank goodness. Same. Yeah, it's like it takes that, um, that sense of fear, which is already really high, that adrenaline is going when you think about this horrible man and then to think about him with your children mm -hmm. is like times a thousand. Yeah. And the things he did to our children is unspeakable, honestly. And the thought of him, like being able to re-traumatize them is just, it's too much. I'm so glad that they don't deserve that. Mm -mm. We both acted in a way immediately as soon as we understood what was going on to protect our children as quickly as we could. I think that's so important. 
It absolutely is. And if there are not children involved, then you need to protect yourself. Yes. And you need to understand that you are important and that you need to, what I call a clean getaway. Mm -hmm. And Pam very much helped me with that because I, I was a little naive and I didn't know what I was dealing with exactly mm -hmm. until I contacted her and she told me her story about what happened when she tried to leave. Which is so great that that Pam, you had this experience and then you were able to turn around and give pointers to Abigail. Mm -hmm. By the time she called me, I had been through so many domestic violence support groups and had been, had kind of a thorough education and how abusers function and how to stay safe and how to get safe and how to help people. So I was ready. Um, but I was honestly, when I left, I, I was in the same position. I, I was so naive to what was going on or I didn't, I didn't know how to get help or how to stay safe as I was leaving. So happy to help. Well, you did a tremendous job and, and I, I owe you. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that you're both here sharing your stories with our listeners mm -hmm. is huge as well. Um, I know that we've talked about this, but the hope being that if someone hears themselves in any way in your stories, that they start to think about things in a new way, uh, themselves in a new perspective, in a new light, and gets to safety, that's our, that's our goal, the prevention. And on that note, is there anything else that you've thought of since we had our individual interviews, advice, red flags, other things you want to impart? I just wanted to say that to those listening that feel that they might be in a dangerous situation, but they're not really sure, go buy a burner phone, order one on the internet, whatever it takes, and keep it as your secret and your secret alone so that you can start to reach out to people that are safe for you to talk with about this. You know, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, your mom. It could be, you know, your, your cousin or a really close friend from growing up that even if you haven't talked to any of these people in, you know, say five years or something, just throw in a time out there. Um, they they do care about you, and they, they do want to hear from you. And they might be afraid that you don't want to talk to them anymore. On the other hand, like, some people just are very ignorant about how to help someone who's experiencing domestic violence. Um, if you get someone saying, oh, get over it, like, don't be such a wimp, or, you know, like, this is just part of marriage. Um, if you feel it in your bones, this is not right. Um, look for someone else to talk to. Uh, I love the saying, don't go to the hardware store for milk. Like, <laughs> you know, don't go, don't go to someone who's just really not being supportive or encouraging you to get help um, for support because they don't have it. Find, keep trying, find someone else. Um, Support domestic violence support groups are often open to people who are still in a relationship trying to leave, um, and they can support you as you, you're trying to make your way out. Yes, and I will say too that's that's a great idea because I ran into a little bit of that myself. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know and they weren't available in that aspect, but you'll you'll find someone. You'll find, you know, several people probably, but it's important to to keep trying to make your exit and to try to not have it be confrontational because most of the time the exit confrontation is when it is the most dangerous for yeah. the victim. And to that end, it's it's very important not to disclose where you're going. Um, as long as you know that it's a safe place for you to go, 
And also, before you make your exit, don't make it known that you're going to leave. And you should gather any vital records that you have and either keep them with you, um, put them in the trunk of your car and keep your car locked, put them at a you know trusted person's house, get a PO box or a you know safe deposit box and put them in there, whatever it takes, because it's very dicey to try to go back mm-hmm. once you're out. Mm-hmm. And I would say even like, if you have anything like a little go bag or stuff stashed away, like even maybe, maybe don't try to put it in your trunk. I had a, a good friend who her abuser discovered it and she really went through it with him after he found the hat. Mm. So just a uh, secret squirrel, <laughs> where can you hide that? <laughs> yeah, have it, maybe have it away somewhere or something where it's, you know, you have a, a plan or something. Some people prepare for the apocalypse, but you have to be prepared and, and kind of think of it as a mini apocalypse in that way so that you can survive and get out safely. So start talking to people who feel safe who believe you, who can help you, start making a plan, act like everything's normal while you're reaching out for help as you strategize. Is that what I hear you all saying? Yes, Mm -hmm. that's what worked well for, for me. And I've heard others that have had a similar feedback that if they didn't do exactly that, then they wish that they had or they feel that it would have been a better outcome. Mm -hmm. Other advice, and I may have mentioned this before, but sometimes the police are not helpful. Um, At the time that I left, I got a restraining order, which allowed for a 15 minute police escort back to the house for me to get uh, vital items. Um, And uh, the dispatcher told me what to do, basically go wait outside the house a few blocks away and a patrol would come and escort me into the house. Well, <clears throat> I did that. The police officer showed up and it was like an old boys club. Like um, he outright refused to help me. He said his wife had left him and someone came into their house to escort her as she gathered her things and There's no way in hell he'd do that to another man. Um, Then he drove away and I was just so shocked. It was like, what are we living in the fifties? Wow. Um, No kidding. So what did you do? Now I had, if it happened to me now, I'd definitely be calling in and reporting that. But at the time I was just so in shock and um, just really uh, trying to deal with so many other things at the time that I didn't, I didn't report it. I didn't do anything. Um, and then something else that happened similar in a similar vein was when I went to renew my straining order, my restraining order, the judge refused. Um, I was in there for an hour with him arguing and I had, um, a really strong advocate with me who is expressing that Um, this restraining order was very important and it was actually working. And this judge was just saying, you know, well, this is a upstanding business owner. It's not fair for him to have a restraining order looming over him. It's great. It's, (laughs) I don't have any words. It's just so shocking. That is such a failure of our legal system there. Yeah. There are no words. That's so wrong. Yeah, and that same judge ended a restraining order. He wouldn't renew a restraining order for a friend of mine either. So <laughs> it's, it's wild. Wow. Well, it's very chauvinistic. Mm-hmm. Their own beliefs are clouding their judgment. And as a judge, that's what they take an oath not to do. Mm-hmm. But here we are. Mm-hmm. It's infuriating. It absolutely is, especially when you're sitting there telling someone that's supposed to be an impartial party that's obviously siding with the guilty party. 
Right. It's so infuriating. And, you know, some other legal things that we had to deal with, the police uh, brushed it off as, well, this this is just a domestic violence issue, not something more nefarious. I agree. I, I In the past, I have called DHS and they came over to examine my child and the DHS worker was a man and he came to my house and he went through all the cabinets and looked at the kid's room and um, is asking me about you know, my personal life about what I'm doing later and is there a man in my life and all kinds of other silly things that he has no business asking. And then I asked him, well, aren't you going to, you know, see the, the marks on my child? And then he says, well, let me, let me talk, you know, have you seen him in the last couple weeks? And the child says, no. And then he looks at me and he's kind of shrugs. He's like, see, there's nothing, you know, going on here. I don't really see any threat. And these are like the most disturbing scars you could imagine that she wanted to show him. Yes. And he just didn't look? Mm -mm. He didn't look and decided that because I wouldn't go on a date with him, that he was going to leave and not write anything down about it and say, well, you know, you passed this inspection or something. Like, I was on trial. Like, I had done something wrong. I had done nothing wrong. That's what it sounded like when you were just talking, Abigail. Like, he's going through your medicine cabinets and your drawers. Like, what? Yes. To make sure everything that I had in my house that, you know, DHS thinks that you should have in your house if you have children, as if I had done something wrong. Wow. And you wouldn't even look at the scars. Yeah, and she was just trying to get him to look at evidence and report it. And he refused, the DHS worker. So I'm going to just have everyone take a deep breath. <laughs> oh, God. Thank you for listening. It's yeah. been very frustrating on this journey, <laughs> but I'm not going to give up. Mm-mm. At one point, we had a detective helping us because there were so many loose ends to check out. And um, she told us she'd never seen anything like it, that this had to be a cover up because of how. Um, everyone concerned, like all the different agencies, how they were responding. In other words, it seemed to this detective like there were so many pieces of a puzzle that it just seemed like they were being manipulated to not come together, Mm -hmm. to not be connected. Mm -hmm. As if records were missing that should have been there, that, you know, if as a detective, the detective told us that it was just very strange that all the things that that they would expect to see weren't present in a case file like the perpetrators. Like, where did these go? Wow. I'm just speechless. Well, (laughs) I... I understand your comment earlier about um, the drastic failure of our our legal system is is real. Mm -hmm. It's on full display here in this story. Yeah. Prior to this happening to us, I was under the impression that we had a, a great justice system that worked on the behalf of people who needed help. (laughs) <laughs> and this is like the opposite of what I found um, just almost at every turn. What are, I know we've talked about red flags for anyone who's listening, who's wondering if they're, you know, if the inklings they've been getting in their gut are based on evidence or if they're going crazy or if something's not right or if it's okay What are we? We've talked about some red flags. Do you have any other red flags that we haven't mentioned yet that you think would be helpful 
for people to to hear? Um, sure, I can speak to that, I think. Um, and anything that you have to add too, Ken. Mm -hmm. um, I would say a lot of red flags, stepping back from this situation, being able to kind of look back on it now, a lot of the behaviors and, and the patterns of things that, that happened, it would appear that there was a, a heavy dependency made. So where I was dependent on the perpetrator for almost everything, I was isolated from my friends, from my family, and I was made to feel very, you know, worthless and I was depressed. And for that reason, that's why I, I ended up being isolated. And even talking to family and friends now about that time, um, I, many of them have said to me that, you know, well, love is blind and we didn't really feel like we could say anything because we didn't think that you would believe us that he was no good for you and that he was no good, period. And I think that's that's kind of a double-edged sword because I really wish somebody would have said something to me. But oftentimes that's not how it goes because it is by design that the perpetrator, you know, has these sociopathic tendencies and practices that they do to their victims, to their targets, um, whatever wording you wish to use. And they, they manipulate their victim so that they think that they've done this to themselves and that they're at fault. And they specifically target certain personality types that are kind and gentle. And it's, it's very unfortunate when, when people are targeted by a monster that is just looking to take you out and to ruin you and to take pleasure in that is just the epitome of, of wickedness. If I may, you know, use that terminology. And it's most deliberate and um, literal. I have a question for you about that, which is that that isolation that you talk about is absolutely by design. That is a strategy and it's tried and true. And everyone who has dealt with abusers knows that that is true, that they work to isolate you from family and friends and support networks. They even work to um, smear your reputation with other people if they can including their own friends. Yes. Absolutely. But here's my question. So every <laughs> every time I read like a dear Abby or <laughs> um advice if you have a friend who's going through uh you know something that you're you're worried about as a, a domestic violence situation the advice is always not to say not to say can't you see he's a creep can't you see <laughs> what he's doing to you can't you see like this, that, and the other? But what they say is to just keep being present and showing up and letting them know if you need them, they're there for you. But my question to both of you is, is that true? Or, I mean, because I just heard you say, gosh, I wish somebody would have just said, God, he's such an ass. <laughs> like, What do you recommend that we do? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a double... It's a double thing here because I, I do recall I, I had a couple friends ask like, "What are you doing with him?" Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you know, he's he's actually not that bad, and you know, making excuses for him, and you know, and like I said, this I, this is just our situation as a female, and you know, a male was the perpetrator, but it can happen in reverse as well. It can happen with same same gender couples, it, it can happen, unfortunately, many different ways. 
to answer your question, it's it's hard to say because I, I've done it both ways. Like I, I thought that I could fix this person. I thought with enough love and caring and just the right you know, kind of, of help that they could change and be the beautiful person that, you know, that they are inside. And, and the truth was that you can't fix anybody that doesn't want to be fixed. You just can't. People have to change themselves or not. And, and that's maybe part of, of why people are constantly told to say that. It's difficult to try to tell someone that because I have had friends where I've been witnessing similar behavior and I've tried to ask them something similar, like, you know, not mm -hmm. say, well, geez, you know, they're such a creep. Why, what are you doing with them? But kind of encouraging them to say, well, you know, you're such a, you know, beautiful person. I think you could, you know, you can find a better mate you know, you're, you're really good looking or you're really smart or, you know, like naming their positive attributes. And I found that the problem is that they, they just don't believe me. And maybe that's part of the other side of it too, that while I wish that someone would have told me that I, in recollection, I, I realized some people did tell me that. And I just um, rationalized it away because I was deep in the thick of it. And I didn't, realize it that makes sense and so yeah I just keep being present is helpful and unfortunately if you if you try to tell them that they're their mate that they're fond of in the moment that they're making excuses for and I say this of myself as well because I, I see it in retrospect um, if you keep telling them that and someone keeps saying that to you eventually you don't want to hear it and you stop talking to them because you don't want to hear them say what a creep that you're going out with yeah i had a after i escaped my relationship that was so awful um i had a really good friend a very close friend start dating a guy who had dated another friend of mine and he was the worst and um my my really good friend was leaving her sweet sweet husband for this dude and i begged her i said i know what he's capable of it is so dangerous for you please do not you know you can leave your husband whatever but do not team up with this guy and she just um, kind of cut me out and she's still with him. And I know it's abusive um, based on what other people have said about what they've noticed. And she's kind of trapped. And um, I've tried to reach out to her a few times just to see if she wanted to talk. And it's just, I don't, I don't receive any response. Mm. But on the other hand, um, when people are telling me things that just seem like they could be going that way, I'll just tell them you, you don't deserve that. That seems a little extreme. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they're making excuses, sometimes I'll add, you know, how much longer can you put up with this? How much longer can you see yourself doing this with that person? And, you know, if the answer is like <laughs> no longer, like just like you said, letting them know I'm here, I'm here for them. I think it, it just takes a bit for it to set in, like how much longer can I do this? And um, once a person has the answer, like not any longer, they can maybe begin to make some changes. I think that's a really beautiful point, too. I think there are a lot of people, and uh, myself included, who can put up with an awful lot of pain and a lot of anguish and feel that what we're doing is actually to someone's benefit or so that we can help someone else and that it's okay to not live in pain and suffering, anxiety, 
fear. It's okay to take care of yourself. It's okay to feel safe. Yeah, you don't have to live in pain. There's like, there's another way. I, I agree with you. I don't think we're here to be living in pain and anguish. I think we're here um, to be living, you know, in, in this space and time on this planet. We're here to be happy. Heck yeah. We're not here to be in pain. <laughs> no. In fact, I was just, uh, I just dropped the episode uh, of domestic violence number three uh, on Friday, I think. And part of it was about what is a healthy relationship. And the very last piece of that is it's fun, mm -hmm. right? It's you get to have fun together Absolutely. and it feels safe and fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's okay to have fun. <laughs> Well, you know, and, and relationships normally do have ups and downs, and there's occasional disagreements, but the disagreements shouldn't involve, you know, tearing the doors off the back of your house or flinging someone down the stairs or draining your bank account or prohibiting you from seeing your friends. It's that That's not normal. Yeah, walking around on eggshells is not normal. No, not at all. So between the two of you, it's a wealth of information. And let's take a second, a uh, deep breath, and let's talk about all the things that you did right. I mean, there are so many things that you did right. You were brave. You were aware. You were strong. You communicated together. You allowed yourself to be validated by one another. You protected your children. You're living in safety right now. I mean, kudos. Well, thank you. I wanted to add, too, that I was told on so many times, so many occasions, how stubborn I was. And now I wear that as a badge. Yes. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, I am. I did not succumb to the psychosis and the hypnosis that he was trying to an act on me and I didn't go under and curl up and die mm -hmm. I left him and Pam did too she yep. left him and she was stubborn and she helped others on top of everything else and, and on top of the incredible amount of pain and suffering that she went through she flipped it around she should have a on or something <laughs> you both got away like huge which leads me to my next question which is about your empowerment as you look back from this perspective in what ways can you see your incredible strength your resilience and your power and I ask this as a beacon of hope for those who might feel like they're still in the mire or still confused or caught in pain and uncertainty, or walking around their life on eggshells. What can you tell us about your empowerment? Well, I'm freaking alive. I'm not dead. <laughs> Looking back, like I know that's where it was going. I I don't think either of us would have survived if we did not get out. Right. I mean, we were laughing, but it's deadly true. You are alive. Both of you are alive. And your children are alive. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. And that's so important. And that we've, we've lived to tell the tale and we, we want to help other people as much as we can. Mm -hmm. Be able to get out alive because that's, that's a big bad statistic that a lot of people don't talk about. It's a very real statistic that at the end, at the exit, if there's a big confrontation, there's a strong possibility that the victim will perish or be severely injured in trying to get away. Because and we know that if there's a firearm in the house, that that statistic goes up drastically. <laughs> but yes, you know, having, having that, you know, it, the statistic can go up. Weapons aren't limited to firearms. They, they can be any blunt object. 
Pam, when we were talking, one of your strategies was to stay out of the kitchen. Oh, yeah. Knives, anything hot in the oven could be thrown at you. There's sharp corners on all of the drawers. Um, yeah, <laughs> I was especially thinking about that because I had to go through the kitchen to escape. What else about your empowerment? Come on, women. <laughs> <laughs> That we can even <laughs> talk about yourselves. Like, let's go here. <laughs> that we can even talk about this, <laughs> I yeah. think, is huge because yeah. this is really difficult to discuss. And yeah. honestly, like, I might curl up on the couch for a while after a conversation because it just takes so much out of me. But um, being able to talk about it openly is huge. And I love that I can make my own decisions now about how I want to live and where and what I do. And I just um, feel so much more free. That's so important. I I couldn't agree more. It's, you know, I, I, I feel so strange sometimes when I go back and I, I did some journaling and I found some journaling recently and reading some of what I was going through was just, mind-boggling I, I had to sit down and I was like wow I was really in the thick of it then just what I was putting up with and everything that I was going through and now I'm so much happier and and like Pam said that we're alive we're here and we get to to be here and we get to we get to help others as we can I think it's important that with, you know, especially with the type of abuser that we had and the sociopathic tendencies, which incidentally, I ended up reading a lot about because I had to figure out what was going on. I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I believe that I, I pretty much nailed that personality type that checked all the boxes. And being able to understand that also helped me to be able to be safe and distance myself from him and his influence um, because he, he did smear my reputation big time mm -hmm. and has continued to try to impersonate me online. And, you know, I think I mentioned in a prior interview, he has used um, some sort of nefarious software that masks um, the identity and of the text message origination and they can type in any number they want and send it to people and pretend to be myself or someone else that's you know close to me to make others think that I'm saying these things that he's actually saying it's pretty uh, pretty terrible but we're we're strong and I'm really stubborn and I refuse to believe that I need to ask his permission to live my life well, both of you have walked through the fire. How we walk through counts. You're alive. You protected your children. You're sharing your stories. And you're both making the world a better place. So thank you for, thank you for talking to me and sharing your stories with my listeners. Well, thank you for having us. It's, it's an honor. And thanks, thanks for listening. It's affirmation time. This is how I end every self-defense class. It's kind of cheesy, but it's very cool, and this is how it works. We're going to do like a little call and response. If you can say this out loud, if you can repeat after me, do it, because it's important, I think, for you to hear your own voice. But if you can't, like if you're on a crowded subway or someplace where it's embarrassing, don't worry. You can also just say it inside your head. Okay? So I'm going to say something, and you're going to repeat it after me. I'm going to give you space to do that. And at the end, we're going to say yes. Here we go. Repeat after me. I am worth protecting. I love myself. I belong. I deserve to take up space on planet Earth. 
I am a strong and powerful person. Yes! Woohoo! And hey, as a wrap up, will you do me a favor? Will you do all the things that you do when there's a podcast? Like, will you tell your friends? Will you subscribe? Will you come back each week? Communicate with me? Review this podcast? Like, all those things to help get more bandwidth, help more people find out about it. That would be super awesome. Take a deep breath. You are amazing. Thank you for being with me. See you next time.